You're listening to audio from the Village Church, a community that's formed by the gospel and sent on God's mission, gathering weekly in the heart of downtown Hamilton, Ohio. For more information about the Village or to connect with us, you can find us online at myvillagechurch.com. Hey all, Michael here, one of the pastors of the Village Church. Thanks so much for uh, hanging out with us this morning. I have been sick with the COVID uh, over the last week, and so um, I'm on the mend at the time of recording, and hopefully by the time you guys hear this, then uh, I'm in a much better shape. So it's er it's earlier in the week that I'm recording this. So thanks so much for all of your grace as we have kind of went to virtual stuff for the end of the year, and um, you know, me being sick was was kind of a logistical obstacle, but along with that, just uh, many other families being uh, affected by quarantine and other things, and so we just thought it best. So thank you so much for your grace uh, as we try to lead the best that we can. So looking forward to hanging out with y'all and, and being back together in January. Um, who is the best leader you have ever seen or, or heard of or or read about? And, and I don't mean like, you know, a, a Girl Scout leader or something. I mean a, a ruler of people on the on a large scale, you know, historical heroes or, or political or, or otherwise, um, who is the best? <clears throat> and then my question beyond that is, on what basis do you say that? Who checks all of the boxes? And then, even more importantly, what are those boxes? And I think what we would find out is that really quickly, um, our scorecards don't quite look the same. And, and we talked about this during the presidential election, but but all of our scorecards don't look the same as it relates to a a fit leader or the best ruler. And so so what is it that matters most? Well, it depends on who you ask, because what matters the most to me might not matter the most to you. We have differing conclusions. But but God, He actually shows us His ideal leader. And, and He not only does that to show us how, you know, how to look out for our own selves and how to protect ourselves and our own interest. Um, but, but also he shows us how to live and who we ought to be. Um, the reality is, is that we all want to be cared for and we all want to be protected and, and valued and cherished and, and we want to be heard and we want to be treated with honesty and, and we want justice to flow from the hands of our leaders. Um, we want to know that others have our best interest in mind and that, that the person that we put our, that, that we entrust isn't going anywhere, right? There's a song that hits home uh, in light of all this. It, it goes like this. I'm never going to give you up. I'm never going to let you down. I'm never going to run around and desert you. I'm never going to make you cry. I'm never going to say goodbye. I'm never going to tell a lie. And hurt you. You probably heard that before, and that sounds like a really good leader. There is a type of leader that that is God's design for His King and for His people. And as great as He is, it's it's not the one who wrote that song. Uh, the burden of this text here in Psalm 101 is 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 this: there is an ideal King who shows His people who to long for and who to be. So as we've been navigating the royal psalms, songs of the king, we're looking at a handful of these messianic psalms that tell of royalty. And, and we know that the psalms were the songbook of God's people, and they continue to be today. So King David, he leads us in song today by singing about this ideal king. Um, now, why would it matter who who the ideal king is, what he rules like, what he lives like? Well, it's it's for, for a few reasons. One, it's so that we know what a good king looks like, what a good king lives like, what a good king leads like. Um, secondly, it's because we we all have ideals, and and we all have assumptions that we take into that kind of um, ideal king. <clears throat> and and those ideals should be shaped by the Spirit, and for us, by the Scriptures. Um, and, and thirdly, because there is a way that is pleasing 
to a man, but its end is is ruin. And that's true for country, that's that's true for kingdom, and that's true for, as we've been seeing, it's true for our own hearts. As we, uh, as we let our own selves rule and reign over our lives. So, so knowing what God calls ideal, it shows us what to look for from earthly rulers, from earthly fathers, from spouses, from servants, from leaders of all sorts. And it lets us know what to be on guard against within our own hearts. So as we look at this text today, and, and again, Psalm 101, we're going to start from the end. We're going to start from the back of it, and we're going to kind of build out, and then we're going to work forward to some, I, th- I think, really practical ends, all right? And so maybe you've heard the phrase before, drain the swamp. It is largely a uh, something that you hear from both sides of a, of a two-party system when they're talking about, you know, uh, getting their guy <clears throat> Or, or, or their person in office to do whatever is whatever it is that they're trying to do. Well, if you think about it, um, th- this is actually a biological term. Uh, in places where malaria were uh, were you know taking over, and, and there, there were swampy regions where mosquitoes were kind of just you know breeding and, and multiplying at at fast rates, they would actually they would actually drain swamps to rid the area of mosquitoes that carry malaria and and lead to human flourishing. So <clears throat> that term was hijacked um, and, and it now means you know our person is going to remove the established ways of corruption. You know there's a new sheriff in town, right? Uh, and and our, our new sheriff is in no one's pocket and they live according to their own standards and their own ways and and the emphasis is is true in modern politics as well as in this passage. And the idea is that that the problem that we have is not just an outsider problem that we're that we have um, wickedness outside that we need to kind of fend off, but it's but it's that we have an insider problem, right? We need to drain the swamp because we all live in the swamp. And so, uh, e- even more incredibly, this ideal king that that we're going to read about, he doesn't he doesn't drain the swamp through partisan politics or or he doesn't do that without compassion or from an ivory tower but uh he isn't disconnected from from the wicked or from the wayward but he joins them all right he is in the world and yet he is not of the world he is in the swamp yet he is not uh infected with uh, wickedness he is near and among yet he's not drawn to play like they do so let's check this out psalm 101 and I just want to look at uh, verses 5 through 8. And then again, we'll, we'll kind of peel back the layers for some super practical stuff. So um, Psalm 101, verse 5. Whoever slanders his neighbor uh, secretly, I will destroy. So this, this ideal king will come in and he will destroy. Whoever has a haughty look and an arrogant heart, I will not endure. Not going to stand for that. I will look with favor on the faithful in the land that they may dwell with me. So those that are in, those that are faithful, those are my guides. Um, he who walks in the way that is blameless shall minister to me. No one who practices deceit shall dwell in my house. No one who utters lies shall continue before my eyes. Right? We're getting rid of all the, the wickedness. Morning by morning I will destroy all the wicked in the land, cutting off all the evildoers from the city of the Lord. I will remove the arrogant. I will give favor to the faithful. I will keep them near and, and my advisors will be upright. And, and I'm ridding the liars and the deceivers and the evildoers. They will be left outside the city of the Lord. All right. So we can assume if this is like a, a song that's really kind of crying of a political speech, we can assume there's been some less than ideal rulers. All right. Um, and what David is doing is he's declaring a contrast. And so David is singing of the contrast between God and his people and his ideal ruler and the the wicked rulers of the earth, right? And if we know God and if we know his people, then we know this, that, that we not only let God down, but we let one another down and, and we even let ourselves down. Despite having a, 
a high moral compass even, or, or high ambition. It almost seems as if our hearts are curved towards corruption and wickedness and, ba- and, and, and backroom deals and payoffs. Because they are. Because we desire to look out for number one in a way that comes at the expense of God's ideal rule, right? Our, our flesh is stained. And, and if left to ourselves, this is our way. Rulers and servants alike who, who aren't mindful, we drift towards corruption. And so what, what this is doing is it's inciting God's people to, to understand who we are in, in light of who God is. And so on the front end of this psalm, I want us to know this together, that um, King David, he shows us how he protects his own life and his own heart as a, as a servant of God and, and, and as, as a leader of God's people so that he might not be drawn to sin, so that he might not be drawn to be unfaithful, um, so that he might not be drawn to live as the world lives, but that he might live in a way that, that looks like God's ideal king. But straight away, this ideal king that David sings of, it, it wasn't David. He knows that. Uh, if you know anything about the life of David, you know that, that he is not the ideal king, although he is a, a good king, and he's a, a king after God's own heart. And in the same way, your ideal version of faithfulness before God uh, for yourself, um, it, it, it's not this ideal king there is one, and it's the one that this points to. David knows that there's a better king coming uh, through his line. And this king has a name, and his name is Jesus. Jesus is the one who came from the line of David, just as promised. And, and Jesus is the one who David sings about, right? He is the ideal king, the ideal servant, the forgiver of sins to all who would believe and call upon his name And we know that Jesus came as a baby in a manger and he would grow up to establish his kingdom and to call us to be a part of that kingdom. And now he has ascended to the right hand of God, ruling and reigning. And one day he will come to establish that kingdom in full. This is the ideal king that David sings about. But like uh, in, in the Old Testament and in the New, the way that prophecy works, and that's kind of a a word from God that, that tells of something that, uh, that's, that's not yet seen, um, it works in layers. And so there are several layers that we get to see here. And, and some of these things are true probably for David. And some of them might be true for us. But ultimately they find their yes in Jesus. So there is an ideal king who shows his people who to long for and who to be. And what David does is he shows us what we ought to do to protect our hearts from being uh, drained out with the swamp, right? So now we're looking at uh, kind of three real practical things I think that can help us uh, live in a way that that both puts the ideal king before us so that we might long for him, and it it also shows us who to be. Psalm 101, verse 1, and this is point number one. It says this, I will sing of love and justice. I will sing of love and justice. When I think of the new heavens and the new earth, I think of many things, and one of them is singing. And at first thought, you might consider some stuffy choir singing outdated songs in a you know genre that, that doesn't quite hit your mark for exciting music. And I used to think that way too, and and sometimes I still do, but just think about music for a second. Think about how powerful music can be. Uh, Concerts. I've been to some great concerts, some really good ones that in moments you just see kind of the crowd singing or, or, uh, you know, just some unity around things that that are just powerful, you know? Um, I, I've mentioned before the guy, you know, walking down my street, just singing as loudly as he can with earbuds in or, or whatever. And you're just like, man, that dude's got 
courage and, and some passion coming out of him, you know. Uh, Disney, Disney knows the power and the profit of, of a well-written song. We probably all sat in worship gatherings that kind of crescendo at heights that just kind of draw us in to the room, into the reality of what we're singing about, or or soccer fans. Soccer fans know the chant of pub songs, redeemed to sing the praise of their favorite football club, and, and there's just unity and affection and camaraderie and joy, although it might be a bit uh, on the drunken side of things. In this house, right? I've been in this room for like a week now, right? <laughs> Isolated from uh, that hallway down there and the rest of my family. But in this house, we, we let uh, music kind of flow through the house at, at times. And um, even when we have bad attitudes, we'll, we'll do something like, uh, I won't do it now, but, you know, hey, hey Google, play uh, Louis Armstrong, What a Wonderful World. All right? And, and man, you can't be in a bad mood when you hear Louis Armstrong singing with that just soulful voice. And so music's powerful, right? There's no doubt. Um, but music is more than an elective in middle school or fun at the pub. The Bible tells us about um, humanity's rich relationship with music. And here are just a few. Psalm 100, um, a psalm for giving thanks. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Why do we sing on the front end of a worship gathering? We get to come into God's presence with singing. Colossians 3, 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Psalm 95. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise with him, uh, to him with songs of praise. Psalm 150. Praise him with, with a clash of cymbals. Praise him with loud clanging cymbals. That's in the Bible, right? Ephesians 5, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. See, it's easy to think that the things of this earth will melt away at the sound of final judgment. <clears throat> Music and, and all of its wicked scenes that it can be associated with. But, but it seems clear to me that the things of this earth are, are slivers of joy and fullness to come when they are redeemed once and for all. So I think the beauty in this life isn't wasted for this life alone, but, but it's redeemed to honor and glorify God and, and bring joy to His people for eternity. What a gift. So, so let it be known, you know, real men and women and, and children sing, and they will sing of love and justice, the song of a king about an ideal king, one who is greater. And that way music is both preventative, it, it redirects us, and it is also medicine to heal. It soothes wearied and troubled souls. And so I want us, I want the Village Church to be a people that expresses the joy of of the Lord, and, and I don't just mean with uh, reading a book while smoking a pipe in the den. I mean with bold passion, expressing the song of our heart, the song of God, the song of His love and His justice. And and as these passages tell us, even when you're not actually singing, you know, in the shower or in your car or together with others. The question that we get to ask is, what is the song of our heart, right? Singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. What's the song of your heart? Are you a Scrooge? Are you a Grinch? Are you a Grouch? Are you a 
a pessimist? Are you a half-empty uh, type of guy? Are you thankful? Are you joyful? We get to do this in part. We get to sing of love and justice. But when Jesus came, he lived a life that sang of love and justice. The second thing that we see, just again real practically, in verse 2, um, is he says, I will ponder the way that is blameless. I just love this. I love the word ponder. Uh, it, it means to consider or to kind of think deeply. And um, if you are a child of the 90s, there is this amazing cartoon called The Animaniacs. And one of the the recurring kind of um, characters were these two mice called Pinky and the Brain. And Brain was always pondering. And he was deep. And he was maniacal. Um, and, and he would always kind of start the show off by saying, hey, hey, Pinky, are you pondering what I'm pondering? And and Pinky would say just dumb stuff like, you know, I, I think so, Brain, but how are we going to get monkeys to wear rubber pants or, you know, something like that. And um, and then then they, they would kind of dialogue and then and then he would say, uh, you know, well, what are we going to do tonight, Brain? And, and Brain would say the same thing we do every night, Pinky try to take over the world, right? That's not our aim in thoughtful consideration, uh, but I do love that brain is, is a mouse of conviction and he's a ponderer, right? To ponder, we need something that we have all but eliminated from our culture. To consider deeply, we need time and we need space, and we need quiet, and we need still. Quick survey of your own life. Do you have regular space, regular quiet, uh, on any sort of rhythm in your life to ponder the way? To ponder the way that is blameless like like add up all of your life you know we'll always make room for what we deem to be most important would would any of us regret at the end of our days and i don't mean rust out i don't mean just sit around and not do anything but would any of us regret at the end of our days carving out intentional rhythms to ponder the way that is blameless before the lord if if wickedness lurks within and without, and we must build our lives with space and quiet to ponder deeply the things and the way of God. We all know this, but when we feed our minds with foolish things, it lures us to live as fools. And so uh, I won't tease these out. Man, I, I wish I had time to do that. But uh, three real quick ways that, that we kind of uh, mess this up is we, we have too much intake. Um, not enough space to just let our minds breathe and ponder things that are not pressing. Uh, and if everything is pressing, and if everything's important, then then nothing is important. Um, and so we have just too much intake, um, information overload. We have unbalanced intake of this world, um, whether it's it's beauty or dream homes or or idealized everything. We could probably find judgment via screen time, something that would just, that would ruin us. J just that alone. Um, so we have too much intake, unbalanced intake of this world, too much of this world, not enough pondering uh, the way that is blameless. And then lastly, just not enough intake of what is good. Um, and, and you might say, well, you know, well, that's legalism. And I don't want us to be fooled into calling this legalism. David knows the trap. He was Israel's second king and, and first good king. Um, and, and from him, the promise of God establishes his kingdom forever. Yet even King David will fall into a trap that bypasses thoughtful meditation on what is good. And it leads him... To, to devastating ways and adultery and murder and all kinds of things that follow him. 
I've been sitting in this room for real for the last, I don't know, five days. Um, I've watched um, Alone on uh, History Channel, which is uh, fantastic. And, and so it's just been really helpful to just ponder a bit uh, of, of what it's like. And in and, and that sense, you know, quarantine or isolation has been a gift. Um, and I know the opportunity we had in 2020, I know for many it's been terrible and, and there's all kinds of emotions and, and things. But, but if anything else, just being forced to, as a, as a global community, just, just halt, uh, even just for a minute, um, to give thought just of time and space, um, that has the opportunity to bring about some gifts. Paul, he helps us in what we ought consider in Philippians chapter 4, and this is what he tells us. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things. Right? You ready for it? So, so think about what is good. And if you do that, the God of peace will be with you. So he's saying, be mindful. Look, the God of peace is always with you. But when we forget, and when we take our eyes off of these good things, these things that, that should bring about thankfulness and, and uh, restore us to the way that is blameless and pure. Um, man, when we think about those things, then the God of peace will be with us. And so he says, ponder purity. This is the way. This is the way that we get to, uh, to live in peace. So, investigate where your mind drifts. Just think about it. Right when you have when you have just a pocket of space and time, where's your mind go? Because that is um, that's an assessment of what's in your heart, and then we get to we get to uh, turn that around, and we get to lead our minds to ponder the way. So we get to feed our minds with what is good. Right, this book, um, being around people that point us to the truth in this book into the king of all kings. The third thing, he says, I will walk. I will walk with integrity of heart. And that's in the second part of verse 2 through 4. When someone talks about walking something out, they mean that, you know, to carry it out, to follow through, to, to journey on. And what what David is saying, in, in, in some sense, that we all get to walk with integrity of heart. Uh, and, and he's showing us that this ideal future king will do this perfectly. I will walk with integrity of heart within my house. The way that I conduct the business of my life will be filled with godly character, with integrity of heart. What does it take to walk with integrity of heart? Well, first, we, we need God's grace in our life. In the presence of the Spirit who redeems and establishes and sustains us. Um, secondly, if you walk with Jesus more than you know a deathbed confession of faith, you will find yourself um, failing to be blameless. But that doesn't mean that we give up. It means that we engage the battle to fight. And so, uh, in these verses, he gives us some very practical ways to, to walk with integrity of heart. And I want to give you three real quick. The first one, he says, I will guard my eyes. I will set nothing, uh, I'm sorry, I will not set anything before my eyes that is worthless. Just think about that. Man, in, in our fight for purity, in our fight to walk with integrity of heart, 
I will not set anything before my eyes that is worthless. And, and that is a, a zinger in today's culture where literally 99% of what people do is utterly worthless and meaningless. Jonathan Edwards, he has a, a list of resolutions that he wrote, and they are convicting. I'll read a couple. Number five, resolved never to lose one moment of time, but improve it the most profitable way I possibly can. Number seven, resolved never to do anything which I should be afraid to do if it were the last hour of my life. Gosh. So he's saying... <clears throat> If this were the last hour that I that I lived my life, would I be doing this? Number 17, resolved that I will live so as I shall wish I had done when I come to die. Is what I'm doing now something that on the other side of death I would look back and say, oh, that was a worthwhile investment of my time. So he says, I will guard my eyes. David's point is, if he is to be a king who leads with integrity, and, and if God's people are to be a people that walk in integrity, what we put in front of ourselves, what we take in, what we consume through the window of our souls, our eyes, it really matters. To walk the walk, we must kindle and stoke affections for the ideal king. The second thing he says here is, is I will not forsake Like the others who have fallen away, I will not fall away. Right? I will be faithful to the end. And again, we have an ideal king, Jesus, who will not forsake his people, even though we forsake him. Man, I heard a story from a friend, a pastor friend of mine. And he talked about this guy, I'll call him Mr. Green. Mr. Green was an old man. And... Uh, He, he said, there's this guy who came to him, um, and he said uh, th this young man was wanting to leave his wife because his physical needs weren't being met. So my pastor friend, he says, oh gosh, yeah, I'm really sorry about that, young man. Um, you're wanting to divorce your wife because she's not meeting your physical needs. He said, how about this? How about you go talk to Mr. Green? Mr. Green is an old man whose wife has been uh, battling cancer for, for months and months and months. Uh, she's lost a leg. Um, and he gets her up. He takes care of her. He carries her, puts her in a wheelchair, brings her into a Sunday gathering so that he can lead her to take communion together to, to remember and declare what Jesus has done through his body and his blood. He picks her up. He puts her in the wheelchair, takes her back home, a great sacrifice to himself. And he said, I want you to tell your story to Mr. Green. And I want you to tell Mr. Green that you're thinking of leaving your wife because your physical needs are not being met. And my friend said, if Mr. Green says you can divorce your wife, then I'll agree with Mr. Green. Right? What a, what a beautiful picture of devotion, not forsaking even when things get difficult. And so the question I ask myself, am I resolved to not forsake my ideal king even when things get difficult? And the last thing he says in this little, you know, uh, little chunk, he says, I will reject evil. And we've talked about this many times Um uh, really helpful grid. There are things in this life that we get to receive. Um, there are things in this life that we get to uh, redeem, that we get to engage. Sorry for my dog. Um, and there are things in this life that we get to just purely reject. And the things in, in this life that are evil, we get to reject those things, right? Um, the point being that that we don't get to leave room for evil in our life. We don't, we don't get to play with fire because we will get burned. And so David aims to be the blameless leader 
to drain the swamp of, of wicked leaders and motives. But he doesn't. He doesn't succeed. And just like David, try as we might, we haven't succeeded either. And that's a dark and hopeless thought. But, but God's people are, are not left in darkness. We are not left without hope because we are just that. We are God's people. That is our hope. It's not that we are perfect and blameless or that King David was perfect and blameless or that the next ruler of the earth will be perfect and blameless, but it's that we have one, an ideal king, who was perfect and blameless. So will you build your life to know him? Will you sing of him? Uh, Will you sing of his love and his justice? Will you ponder the way that is blameless? Will you let him lead you to walk the way of integrity of heart. And I hope so. So continue to sing with us. Uh, Thanks for your grace. Um, Thanks for your prayers. And I can't wait to see you all soon.